the tapes that we have produced. Uh, I've done some very interesting interviews with researchers that I think belong to the dissident line in American ufology. We even organized the American Academy of Dissident Science with Al Bilek uh, to try to spread around uh, all the scientific discoveries that have been suppressed by the Illuminati for more than a century. And uh, so with these interviews, I always gravitate toward researchers or eyewitnesses that have something to say different from the party line. Why don't you pull it off the hook? Uh, the film on that's called Occult National Socialism or Magic National Shamanism is a panel discussion with Chan Johnson and Al Bilek on the extraterrestrial and celestial roots of uh, Nazism. Uh, I mean, the real roots for everything that happened in Germany <coughs> and all the atrocities uh, perpetrated by the SS and the Nazis lie much, much deeper, actually much, much higher beyond, uh, beyond our planet uh, beyond the shallow causes given to us by the political, economic, financial explanations for the origin of the Second World War, uh, through banking and political conspiracies and so on. Uh, the secret societies in Germany, uh, the Thule, the Brill, the Fugin, and many others, were at the forefront of the ideological, um, how should we say, indoctrination and preparation of the Nazi party and the elite of the SS. And it's a lot more important to know what these societies were standing for than to know what was decided on this or that Nazi party congress at Nuremberg. On top of the, uh, I mean, these secret societies were the main ideologues of the Nazi philosophy. However, these societies were only the agents or the fifth columns, the manipulators, on the level of our planet for the interests of half a dozen alien races, the Pleiadians, the, uh, the Orions, the Greys, that have been stationed permanently here on Earth and that have been fighting with other alien races for supremacy on the planet, according to our belief. Uh, half a dozen alien races were involved in the with the Germans and the Nazis. Pleiadians joined in to help because they were worried that their uh, Aryan seed on the planet would get wiped if the Germans get too much beaten during the war. So that's why they joined in with their mythology. So did the Orions, so did the little greys and so on. According to the tape, a lot of concentration camp in inmates, I mean they wanted people to, according to our billet, the little greys wanted uh, people to abduct and experiment on, and Hitler said, uh-uh, you can't touch the Germans here, but take as many as you want from the concentration camps. So a lot of the missing uh, persons from the camps may have ended elsewhere. Uh, The aliens on, on the Germany side that were fighting the aliens on the Allied side, the aliens themselves were subcontracted for the Agartian faction of the falling, fallen angelic presence on our planet. That Agartian faction was fighting with the Shambhala faction of possibly the same fallen angelic presence on the planet. Hitler wa himself was a channel for one of the members of the Giza intelligences, this alien race that lives under the Giza pyramid. The Giza intelligences that had been a mortal enemies of the Pleiadians of Billy Meyer, that came to the planet in the 20s and activated a long abandoned complex under the pyramid. And one of them, and in the film we give the name, according to Chan Johnson, a person who has spent a lifetime investigating exactly the secret occult roots of Nazism and uh, 
the SS. He has a previous lifetime recollection of being a Luftwaffe pilot and falling down in flames, and hence his infatuation with uh, everything German. But he is not a neo Nazi, definitely not a neo Nazi. On the contrary, with this film, uh, because sometimes, twice actually, I've been accused of being a neo Nazi. I just got a badge that bans the swastika here, and I'm gonna wear it in the future on all conferences. But with this film, we want to prove that not only, well, the research that we've been doing has nothing to do with neo-Nazism. On the contrary, we would show that the Germans were associated with some of the not very spiritually advanced races in the universe. I mean, even the planes are not that far advanced. We have to face it. They have had interstellar flight for 120 million years, and they have had no war zone for only 50,000 years, which is just a millisecond from their overall interstellar flight history. I mean, how many cities have they exploded in nuclear wars? How many continents? How many planets? How many stars? The Eye of God in the Lyra constellation was the last star that they exploded 180,000 years ago or whatever, 100 something thousand years ago according to their, uh, I mean, they've been vicious, brutal savages on a, on a different level as much as the Amazonian scalp, or, uh, scalp hunters and <laughs> man eaters are, cannibals are. So basically, there were, I mean, the alien presence on the planet was divided in two camps fighting each other, and so were the angelic presences on the planet of the falling, uh, fallen angelic type. Basically, the Shambhala and the Agartha faction of the Luciferian planets on the planet were fighting each other. But that's how the Luciferian universe operates. They always, the left Luciferian hand battles with the right Luciferian hand for the further continuation and furtherance of the illuminated Luciferian idea, uh, ideal. Are you talking about our planet? And uh, quite many others, the way I understand it, with my personal humble opinion and understanding, but in the Lucifer Rebellion, uh, about a third of the local sector planets took side and are still on that side. So uh, it's, uh, we're talking about several hundred planets in the nearby chunk of our galaxy that took side in the Lucifer Rebellion. According to the Rancho book, I've never been on these planets. I have no personal information. Uh, so Hitler himself was a channel, he was a trans channel because at the end of his speeches he would fall down unconscious. Uh, and he had to be carried out of the auditorium. He had nightly visitations, he had ghosts, and so on. I mean, some of these intelligence have been face to, in face-to-face -face contact with him. Uh, in this tape also we talk about the Nazi and the SS elites exercises in shamanism, witchcraft, and Satanism. Uh, the Eagle's Nest Villa had all kinds of drawings on the walls with the most horrific combination of, how should I call it, sexual and satanic and other aberrational art that one can imagine. Uh, a lot of the Nazi involvement with black magic, with Satanism, with shamanism came surface on the uh, Nuremberg trials, but not a line was put on in the public record. National Socialism, together with Communism, Fascism, and the, and the in fashion these days, let's call it the New World Orderism, are but the different faces of the same old wolf of the global Illuminism. Uh, trying to accuse somebody of being a neo-Nazi is a very funny word because what is a Nazi? I mean, the Nazi is a different size of the multifaceted coin that has communism on the other side, that has illuminism, that has fascism, that has basically the brave uh, New World Order boys. Okay, it's not every ism there is, actually. Exactly. This is exactly my point, and I'll, I'll talk at length about all the isms that were played. So this is once more the tape that's called Occult National Shamanism or Magic National Socialism. Uh, 
Uh, then we have another very interesting tape, which is uh, the German viewpoint on the British crop circle, the tape that was produced by Michael Hasselmann. Uh, in my opinion, this is the best documentary so far about the co crop circle. Uh, I think I am out of that tape, but if you give me a, what is it called, a rain check, I will send it in the mail two days from now. I just bought some new dubbing decks at home. Uh, the film shows a mini disc, an observational orb that zigzags and hovers uh, around uh, the body of a moving Concorde on its maiden flight. Shot that was taken from a chaser plane nearby. And you would see the orb coming down from under the Concorde plane, coming here up and down, then moving along the windows, peering through the windows. This is a supersonic speed road. And then disappearing away. It also shows an observation orb going between the legs of the Apollo module, the spider, standing on the lunar surface. Probably the saucer boys of the secret government were checking on their lesser developed brothers, the rocket boys, how well they have just landed on the lunar surface. Um, there's also, yeah, the, the footage of the... Are these all the... Uh, and of course they have a lot of footage on the crop circle, probably the best film that I've seen so far. Uh, then we produced a very interesting new film, The Hollow Earth, or a Nazi, in brackets Illuminati to be exact, uh, underground uh, South Polar city of two million people called the New Berlin. Free energy source of dreadnoughts in low level demo flights over testing grounds in Germany, 1942-45. Uh, ID numbers, insignia, and the pilot's head are clearly visible through the perspex cupola. Panzer turrets and naval artillery turrets were suspended upside down on the underbelly of these craft. Some of them were dreadnought size, and we would see them soon in the are presentation. These drawings are actual photographs. Photographs. These are all photographs. Uh, also, in that film, they talk about German World War II space flights with the exosmospheric craft, half a dozen craft to the moon, Mars, and beyond. Uh, most important is the German secret presence in the colony, the German colony in the South Pole, on the South Pole. Admiral Byrd's expedition in 46-47 to fight the Germans, the unsuccessful expedition, he was beaten back in about two weeks, lost most of his planes and retreated in disgrace. Uh, and subsequent recent rumors that we've heard about uh, an underground city that is two million people strong. The tall, blonde, blue-eyed, Nordic type guys that a lot of contactees have seen behind the scenes in a little gray abduction scenario may be nothing more than the new Superman German that were genetically engineered by themselves and the other alien and celestial presences on the planet from the South Pole doing a much broader scale experiments on the whole of the American population. They did these experiments in private labs late last and early this century, in private Illuminati <coughs> labs. Then they did them in a broader uh, scale in the German concentration camps. I'll be talking about um, hybrids between humans and animals that the Germans did in the camps, living, walking, breeding hybrids. They were, 50 years ago, they were that advanced. Then, in the late 40s, early 50s, on, in the South Polar Colony, then they, they did this experiment in a much broader scale to the point that now they have engineered themselves so much that they live a lot longer than we do. Uh, they have bigger capacities, whatever, brain capacity and so on. The question is, how far advanced is their moral development and their spiritual development? This is probably the prototype that the New World Order and the Illuminati would like to impose on us in the future. So now they are repeating the experiment at a high level here in the American society with the little gray abductions. That's my feeling. So this is a very interesting film on the German South Polar presence and on their advanced anti-gravity craft. Then, of course, we have several other films here. One is the terrestrial component of the alien presence, or one century of secret Illuminati projects well known to the public as the new and ultimate threat, the alien threat. Uh, for one century uh, or more, the Illuminati super black R&D projects, 
me in anti gravity, space flights, mind control, and human genetic engineering have been very conveniently covered up behind real alien visitation. And the little greys are a good candidate for the cyborgian or biological robot Igors of the underground gulago of government Frankensteinian factories, where genetic uh, research on humans goes full blast, including hybrids with animals. What the Germans did 50 years ago in the concentration camps is done on a much greater scale in the underground uh, cities here. We have another film uh, that is uh, its upcoming, Free Energy, the Illuminati Anathema. Uh, and in that film, we would compare German free energy dreadnoughts of World War II that reached the moon and Mars without using a drop of fuel uh, with the Illuminati manufactured Element 115 saucer of Bob Lazar, the gas guzzling saucer of Bob Lazar that uses an incredibly expensive fuel. The Illuminati and the bankers make sure that in the next and the other centuries to come, of all the other available free energy saucer drives in the universe, they would choose the very few ones that have expensive fuel. And what a more expensive fuel than an element 115 fuel that is not even found on this planet and has to be brought from far away. Uh, in this way, they assure you that if you want to drive a saucer, basically you have to give them all your pay for a lifetime in order to be given the privilege to have a private element 115 driven saucer. At the time when the Germans went to the moon, on free energy 50 years ago. And Tesla had a free energy car 80 years ago that ran for three years without any problem. John Keeley created a free energy 250 horsepower locomotive in the 1860s, 1870s that was pulling trains and many other free energy devices. Illuminati, the Illuminati reached the moon in the 1890s with free energy, I suspect. The drive for their gyroscopic anti-gravity drive in that shell that was fired from the cannon. Uh, then we have another tape about the famous footage, the shuttle footage um, of these magical ice crystals that, according to NASA, were nothing more than ice crystals. And in that film, we would make the analogy between the magical bullet and the, ma I mean the, the, the magical ice crystals, the cousins of the magical bullet. Uh, the government spin controllers rely on magic when they have to explain things like the Kennedy assassination or the secret alien presence in orbit, and in the film we explore the possibility whether these are, are these really aliens shooting it out at our doorsteps, or are these alien ships being fired upon by the U.S. government's ground-based Star Wars uh, Black Project developed beam weapons, or is it again a cleverly staged and orchestrated smoke screen involving several U.S. government produced saucers conveniently shooting quote, quote, at each other in bright view from the shuttle window, just in time for the next congressional hearings or on Star Wars budget appropriations. Uh, then we have a brilliant tape with Helga Morrow, the organizer of this conference here in Sedona, about the life story of her father, Professor uh, Kuppers, Professor Dr. Kuppers. Uh, about the fact that he went to the moon, to the inside of the moon, to Mars and to the inside of Mars with the uh, uh, Philadelphia project type teleportation technology that was developed by the American government almost half a century ago. It's an incredible tape for anyone who is seriously interested into the Philadelphia project and the teleportation development on the planet. Then we have two interviews with Al Bilic, the third and the second underground interviews. In the third interview, he speaks at length about the time tunnel, which is the third generation space travel. Basically, with a time tunnel, they can teleport, they can tunnel to any point in time and to any point in our universe in real time. With teleportation, they can do that from planet to planet, maybe to the nearest star, to, to, to the few nearest stars, provided they have a receiver station on the other end or without a receiver station, probably between the planets in our solar system, or from an orbiting ship to, to the surface of the planet. It doesn't work as far as the time tunnel does. So on top of developing the Star Trek nuclear-powered craft that were built by the Rockefeller Foundations and some other private foundations on this planet, 
the next generation transportation that the Illuminati have ready up their sleeve, when in the future they would announce the nuclear power craft to the population, they would have to have one level of a higher secret transportation technology that would allow them a competitive edge. And the time tunnel is the third grade, the third level above even the tele uh, transportation technology. Then we have a take on the close encounters of the Foo Fighter kind. Uh, introduction to Nazi anti-gravity research and development in the 30s and 40s. And we, we talk in that film about 50 models of flying saucers with piston, bank of turbo, pulse, ramjet and rocket engines with spinning magnetic fields or powered by free energy. Uh, we talk about the exosmosphatic exos and space flight capabilities of this these craft around Earth orbit to the Moon and to Mars, according to German documentary films. We also talk at length about the Nazi Antarctic underground base and Admiral Byrd's failed campaign against them. We have a film on the underground, uh, on the alternative three uh, joint secret landing, saucer landing on Mars in 1952, May 22, 1952. Is that 62 or 52? I have a feeling that it was 62, uh, 52, not 62, because they landed in, with saucers much earlier than, than... In the film they claim they landed with rockets, but this is not a rocket landing, and we'll see why. Uh, we have a film, uh, this is a lecture and seminar, a seminar by Col Colonel Marina Popovich. Uh, she's a decorated military test pilot from the Soviet Union, from the Soviet Air Force. The film is titled "Duel for Glasnost over Russia. In that film she talks about a crash-landed UFO that was brought down with a surface-to-air missile in the late 80s over Soviet Caucasus mountain. And uh, also a photograph of the giant mothership that was photo a shot that was taken from the Russian unmanned space probe Phobos when it approached the Martian moon Phobos. Very close to the moon, there was a giant 22 kilometer long mothership parked there by somebody, and the Russian probe took the picture before it vanished. Then we have a whole list of audio tapes from the available from the Graduate School of Conspiratology and the American uh, Academy of Business and Sciences. Based on mainly these tapes are about the three, uh, the secret societies of the planet. A tape revealing the Freemason in the Masonic lodges, the Illuminati fifth column on the planet, tape by Ron Carlson. Uh, another tape on the Illuminati Council of Foreign Relations, exposed uh, by Myron Fagan. This is a three LP record set of uh, uh, about three hour long tape. Uh, the Illuminati infiltration of the American Secret Central Committee or the Council of Foreign Relations that runs the uh, United States behind the scenes together with the Trilateral Commission. Uh, another tape of the Trilateral Commission itself by J.C. Lewis, 90 minute long, uh, which reveals that the Trilateral Commission is an, again an Illuminati outfit to speed up the coming of the one world government and the new world order. An outfit created by and financed by Rockefeller after World War II. A very interesting tape by Anthony Sutton called The Order exposes Yale University Secret Society, uh, the 322 or the Skull and Bones, which is one of the secret Illuminati prep schools for the Golden Party Youth, uh, the future rulers of the country and the new United World and the torchbearers of the illuminated enlightenment on, uh, on the planet. And I wouldn't be amazed that, on top of everything else, this is also a quite well camouflaged <coughs> satanic cult that operates on a university campus. I wouldn't be amazed because a lot of the symbology of the skull and bones, including the very shape of the bones and the skull, are the same that they do on satanic rituals. And in symbology, nothing is coincidental. The, the, grand ma the grand masters of the, the uh, Freemasons and the Knights Templar both use skull bones on their gravestones. That's a very good type. point. The grand masters of uh, Freemasonry and the Knights Templars use the skull bones. And so did the SS on their uniforms. Uh, it's a very good point that uh, occurred here. 
Then uh, we have a three hour long tape that Rachel components of the alien presence uh, on the Secret Illuminati project swandered to the public as the new and ultimate threat the alien threat. After the collapse of the Russian bear, they urgently need a new threat. Oh boy, how urgently they need a new long term threat. The echo threat is the sister to the alien threat, the Mickey Mouse alien threat. We will talk about this in the lecture. But this tape covers basically one uh, century of Illuminati super black research and development projects in anti-gravity, space flights, mind control, and human genetic engineering that's being conveniently covered up behind real alien visitations on the planet. Hundreds of races visit us each year, but behind that there is a very substantial illuminated component of terrestrial developments that it's very easy for them to explain away, away as all alien, being all alien. And in that tape, we would make the claim that the little greys are the government-developed biological robots or cyborgs, the little Igors of the underground gulag of government Frankenstein and factories, as uh, Anthony Hilder called them. And also, we have a lot of papers. I wouldn't go through all of the papers. Basically, all of this material is uh, very well represented in different papers. And now we can go on with our slide presentation. If we can turn on the projector, please, in the back, the button goes upward. On the back, on the back of the back, right, rightmost, up and up and up and up. To the top. Excellent. Uh, after the tabloid sources, Let's summarize the first step. I was backtracing my quote quote discovery of anti gravity through the anthropology of myth approach. I just did a big file and I put there all the stories about anti gravity that I could find. And in the first step, we went over my sources uh, from <coughs> ancient astronaut accounts, from modern day contactee. Cases actually will go uh, through the contact cases right now. Uh, biblical and ancient revelation prophecies, uh, revelations, uh, modern day revelations like the Urantia book and the Waski book and the Billy Meyer Chronicles. Uh, we talk about the secret symbology, the meanings of the swastika as a swirling whirlwind of etheric energy, and the Star of David that have much deeper physical meaning than just being a, a symbol of a political movement on our planet. And now we will be talking at length about more hardcore evidence, academic evidence. And we started with a case of academician uh, Nikolai Kozirov from the Pulku Observatory. He died in 87. Who did incredible experiments uh, with uh, spinning gyroscopes. In this very simplified photograph, I have a red gyroscope here that is spun in motion by a very simple electromagnetic device. The gyroscope is balanced on a precision laboratory scale, and let's say it weighs 100 grams before spinning. We spin the gyro and we measure the weight again, and if it spins left, leftwards, it weighs 95 grams. If it spins counterclockwise in the other direction, it's, it weighs 92 grams. Academician Saharov did a step, went a step further. As a true Russian patriot who cannot do an experiment without involving <coughs> vodka or tea, he decided to add the variable of a strong Russian tea to the equation, and to his astonishment, he discovered that if the already spinning gyro that weighed, let's say, 95 grams, you approach the gyro without touching it with a cup of hot Russian tea, the moment you drop a sh sugar cube in the tea and start mixing the tea and having the tea dissolve, the gyro whoop, drops down with another 5 grams. Incredible result. That can be done by dropping few spoonfuls of cold water into a cup of hot water, not necessarily sugar on it. Hot water mixing in cold water. Uh, these are 
time-wise unidirectional processes. You can dissolve the cube of sugar, you can't do the other ways around to get the sugar out of solution and produce the cube from the viewpoint of physics without expanding energy, of course. You can distill the water, boil the water out and get the sugar, but uh, the universe goes in the direction of uh, sugar dissolving, the, the solution. Uh, this is a non-reversible thermodynamic pro process from the viewpoint of physics. It cannot be reversed in time. Like frying the egg. After we fry the egg, we cannot put it back in the shell. <laughs> and all such processes appear to influence gravity by strange reasons that even Professor Kozirov wasn't very sure about at the beginning. After that, he arrived at a very general theory about gravity that has been uh, 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 experimented with by several other Russian academicians, and, it, and they do the experiments right now. De Palma, another uh, scientist with background from uh, MIT and Stanford, and a teaching experience at MIT, he was a physics lecturer at MIT. He started investigating 20, 30 years ago the problems of rotation, and particularly the ro rotating uh, unipolar or one pole Faraday generator, Faraday dynamo. Uh, there is a, a copper disk sandwiched between two magnet disks, magnet donuts, <coughs> spun on a shaft, and you had two brushes. One brush is touching the shaft, the other brush is touching the periphery of the disk, and a potential difference of one volt appears here. Unlike normal generators that have drag because the magnetic field of the rotor acts like a magnetic glue dragging with the magnetic field of the stator, it's very difficult to turn them, and that's why all the power of the turbines driving the generators in the electrical station, a lot of it goes for overcoming this uh, drag. Unlike that, the generator you can spin by hand, and uh, there's no drag. Basically, the drag is zero, whether there is load or there is no load. No physicist can explain that. Current physics, as we know it, the party line university academic physics cannot explain that. There's no cutting of lines of force by that generator. Exactly. It probably cuts the etheric lines of force of the planet, but there's no ether, according to modern science. So, ergo, this generator cannot exist. And if it does, the guy's a crackpot. And off goes the power out of the university. Uh, so, his experiments involved collision experiments where two cartridges loaded with weights, one will be with a gyro, another one just with a weight, would be collided with each other. And when the gyro spins and when the gyro doesn't spin, his gyro cartridge behaves as if it has different mass. So spinning obviously influences the mass of that cartridge. The cart uh, this carriage, I'm sorry, this is a very simple wheel carriage. Uh, they do this, this is a high school physics we're talking about. You collide two things and then measure the impulse, measure the momentum, measure the velocity, and so on. Uh, when the gyro spins and when the gyro doesn't spin, the carriage behaves as if it has a different mass. Then he put a gyro on a pendulum and started swinging it. And the pendulum has its uh, frequency of, 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 of swinging, which is constant. Uh, the height of the swinging can change, but the frequency remains constant. Uh, that's why we can measure time, because this fundamental and unexplainable property of the pendulum, and it can be basically demonstrated with formulas, but nobody knows why, why these things happen. These are the most fundamental secrets of nature. Even the Platons don't know why electricity flows. What the electricity is, they can use it far better than we do, but even for them it's a big puzzle. Uh, so this pendulum <coughs> Swinging with the gyro spinning and not spinning, it has different frequencies. It means that again the mass changed. Then, if you approach uh, an electric uh, clock, quartz clock, 
next to a spinning gyro, it, it lags, increases dramatically. It starts lagging behind by like 15 seconds a week instead of one second a month or something like that. If we approach a spinning gyro with a tuning fork, the tuning fork changes its pitch, which again, here in the form of the pitch, the mass of the fork is involved. So obviously the spinning gyro affects space-time continuum around itself and every object that's nearby. So that's the con con conclusion of Bruce de Palma's experiment, that rotation changes mass and weight. Uh, there was a brilliant article in the Flying Saucer Review Journal, a little bit of contact here comes, that basically found that majority of the saucers observed spin or something spins. Either the whole house spins or the outermost part of the house spins. Or if nothing spins outside, you will hear the noise of an electric generator or an electric drill, which are spinning electric machinery. If you don't hear any noise, you will see light spinning around the craft. When the craft takes off, the frequency of spinning increases. Also, the lights may change their color because of the frequency of the light changing. So, this initial hunch that I had many years ago that because of the rotational symmetry, maybe spinning is involved, was greatly reinforced here when I found an article by professional ufologist, a Flying Saucer Review magazine is one of the top British and probably one of the top five world UFO journals, investigative journals, and I greatly admire everything they do. Not as good as physical review letters, professional academic physics journal, but in the marginal schizoid reality of UFO literature, this is probably the best there is. And so I was astonished to find something that I had heard so many years earlier, that basically spinning may be associated with flying saucers. Then I went to my massive UFO contactee database. In the book and film, the film is called UFOs, It Has Begun. The book is called UFOs, Past, Present, and Future. They talk about a San Diego dock worker that asked his uh, <coughs> aliens, how the hell do they, they are so suspicious? They say, oh, it's very simple, it's a flying electric motor. The rotor, the red one, spins one way according to uh, uh, along a vertical axis. The whole starter, the, 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 the blue, blue one, spins the other way. And the cabin on top is gyroscopically stabilized so that the pilots would not spin into insanity with the cabin. Uh, such a construction explains the crop circle whirlwind, which is a field of rotating uh, electromagnetogravitic and etheric vertex under the anti-gravity drive of the craft, which is basically an electric motor. If we have a big electric motor, flat motor, spinning over a growing grass, I wouldn't be amazed that the grass would assume the same crop circle type formation, even with the a lot lower intensity of the field of a electric motor. We can't produce at least our official science and technology cannot produce such strong field as you can produce under an anti-gravity drive. So one of the contactee accounts talks about anti-gravity saucers being powered like an electric, flying electric motor. Uh, this is a very interesting contactee account from Red China. And here, unlike in Britain where the crop circle is on the surface, on the ground, here, the drive of the craft affects space-time and the atmosphere in such a way that we have a circle formation on the underside of the craft. We have a white and a black forces chasing each other in a kind of a never-ending yin and yang frenzy. 
ever chasing and never reaching each other. This is a rotational dipole. The yin and yang is basically a rotational dipolar vertex. I've seen also a triple yin and yang where three entities are changing each other in a circle. This is a, a rotating tripole. The swastika is a very simplified representation of a rotational quadrupole, a four pole, plus minus plus minus rotating. We would see very soon that this is exactly the case. Some Russian experiments prove that the swastika is basically a representation of their quadrupolar anti-gravity drive. Another contactee report, UFO's contact from the planet Ayarga. Star Wars. I mean, Star Trek. Looks like some of the figures. Uh, this is a creature that uh, appeared from... You, you, on some of these things, you may make a close in. Can you do it with a remote? Fascinating. And... Uh, these are creatures that evolved from amphibians. Incredible swimmers can swim five times as fast as we do. Have very sturdy skulls because they are the G-force is three times as strong as ours, and the uh, uh, height of a deadly foe is just 60 centimeters. If they fall from more than 60 centimeters, they die. Mm -hmm. Here, a deadly foe is about two floors high. Well, one, one story, maybe two story, depends how. Anyway. Incredible book. The contactee was a, uh, an architect and an engineer by training, so he left brilliant drawings. I mean, he retained most of what he saw in one, uh, in one day holographic presentation aboard this alien craft that he was taken on from his boat in Holland. And uh, what this guy described is a very detailed three-dimensional cutout of their saucer craft as big as Queen Mary, this is 300 yards diameter giant craft that they use to navigate the universe but doesn't have superluminal velocity so basically these are like flying cities they would fly many generations in them exploring different planets and stars and the key component of this craft are these donuts, these rings on the periphery of the craft, these two and this triangular cavity. The triangular cavity and these two donuts. These two donuts are counter-rotating uh, synch uh, synchrotron rings. Uh, it's fascinating. Do they have to rotate or can they just send particles around? No. What the guys figured out that instead of spinning the whole hull of the craft, Instead of spinning brute mass, a lot of tonnage at slow RPMs, you can spin at high RPMs, a very little mass, and you would arrive at the same product. It's mass <coughs> times RPMs. So instead of spinning the whole craft in a very inefficient drive, all the bearings would wear down, as was the case of the first German saucers. They would keep the craft stationary, and they would spin few elementary particles in these two rings at near relativistic speed. So basically their weight is almost nothing, but the speed is almost everything, so <laughs> they get the same effect. Again, we have spinning. If we can't spin the brute mass of the craft, we can spin a magnetic field like these electric motor. Well, it's a combination because the, ele the magnetic field spins, but also the mechanical part of the electric motor spins. Uh, there have been patents patents in, in, in Germany in the 30s for creation of a spinning magnetic field with a stationary non-spinning hardware. So if you go a step further, you don't even have to have an electric motor to create a spinning magnetic field. You would have some sections that would be turning on and off and on and off in a circle, and they would create a spinning magnetic field. I mean, th this is technology that has been in the patent office since the 30s. Here, the Iargans are spinning elementary particles. Uh, I heard another story, government contacted that what they did was they got a big quartz crystal, a cylinder of a crystal, then 
they got a metal, uh, a magnet wire, wire of magnetic material, and they want some electric conductor over this magnetic long bendable wire, whatever, mm -hmm. like a thin sausage. They want the electric conductor around it, and they obtain an electromagnet. Then this pliable electromagnet was wound around this big quartz crystal, which resembles, by the way, a millstone. This is probably <laughs> where the story of that millstone in the Mahabharata legend came from, or maybe there are countless other physical ways to create such a millstone resembling source of drive. But anyway, when the magnetic, basically it's kind of a linear magnet, this magnetic wire is wound around the quartz crystal and then we have the current over it, it would help all the electrons and maybe even the nuclear particles inside to orient themselves and start spinning along the vertical axis because if they are oriented in all chaotic different uh, directions, it cancels mm -hmm. all, all these chaotic the, uh, directions of spinning, they cancel each other and the net effect is zero. So that's why things wait on the planet. Otherwise, if, the, if they didn't cancel anything, they wouldn't wait anything and they would fly away from the planet. Whoever created the world thought that, well, we have to keep the buggers on the planet. If they start floating freely in space, we would lose them. <laughs> so that's why in normal crystal objects, uh, all these spins, all these little rotations of electrons and nuclear mm -hmm. particles and everything are oriented chaotically in every direction. But if we can reorient them in the same vertical direction, in the same direction, vertical, then we obtain what Uh, sorry. What the Iardans did with their drive, they were spinning few elementary particles in a synchrotron ring. In the quartz crystal, they don't inject the electrons are already there in the crystalline lattice of the quartz crystal. They just have to reorient them and to spin them in a desired direction. So you can spin the particles along a giant loop around the craft, or you can spin the particles, many particles, along the nuclear, the, the nuclei of the atoms. I mean, the universe is so uh, boundless, and there are so many ways, different ways of producing anti-gravity. I repeat, the Pleiadians discovered 1,600 basic modes of anti-gravity propulsion in their wanderings to the universe, and they have on their computers identified a million and eight hundred thousand civilizations. And among them, they have 1,600 basic different propulsion modes. Here in this lecture, we will touch upon probably 20 or 30. So, this is a drawing of the Iargon drive, the synchrotrons, the blue one spinning clockwise and the red one spinning anti-clockwise. A Russian contractee, a colonel from the Red Army, uh, was told by his aliens after they gave him a joyride <coughs> in, his cra in their craft, that, oh, it's very easy to produce anti-gravity. It's a spinning nuclear reactor. You have a big nuclear reactor along a very powerful shaft spinning around, and by lowering or pulling out of the control rod, you regulate the, 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 the anti-gravity force of the drive. The reactor is spun around by uh, solar energy, and it spins constantly, and probably along ideal bearings that don't wear and tear and don't, and the RPMs don't die down. So by pulling out the rod, the saucer rises. By dropping down the rod, the saucer lands. And there is a smaller second nuclear reactor perpendicular to the first one that would push in this direction so that the saucer would fly horizontally parallel to the surface of the planet. Another case of rotation. Uh, a third contactee case, the UMO craft, a contact in Spain, talks again about some electromagnetic cavities 
along the periphery of the craft, a donut-shaped electromagnetic cavity. They don't give much detail, but I wouldn't be amazed that this is a system very similar to the Iargon system of counter-rotating uh, tuned beams of elementary particles. Go green, the government party line contact with a politically correct little grade. Uh, they have, uh, these are iron drive crab because when they land, they sinter and they bake the ground so that no grass can live, uh, can grow there for more than a year. The electromagnetic drives not only do not bake and sinter anything, but crop continue to grow without even developing a burn on them. They just bend horizontally and start growing horizontally. So even in the iron drives, we see that the drive has some circle to it. Whether this is a condenser plate coupled, this is not only this is a drive system. This ring and the thing creates a very powerful light. It may also be an electrostatic condenser type anti-gravity, but we will not go. Uh, I'll go over this in the in the in the, in the book that I'm finishing right now. I mean, there's so much about anti-gravity. Right? One can easily write a thousand-page monograph just going briefly over them. When uh, these uh, iron drive craft land they burn and sinter the ground and it remains here yeah sometimes they will produce ice in midsummer one inch to two inch thick ice due to condensation rapid condensation of vapors or due to creation of the ice ice out of the ether, basically the angel dust that falls off flying saucers is a byproduct of their saucer drive that creates objects out of thin air, out of the ether, the way the yogis can create gold objects or other things, the adepts, like Sai Baba can create objects out of thin air. One of the signatures of free energy machines is cooling things down quite a bit, and maybe that's a signature from a free energy type. Drive Very good point. Uh, cooling down may be a signature of free energy type drive, and it is a signature of the free energy machines. Again, we have a Galbraith craft, and we see the drive a circular shape. Here, this is a detail that nobody has observed so far from Bud Hopkins' book, uh, his first contacted case. The landing track, this is how his research started. He realized that uh, 